Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Seeker Plus today. I am Trace, and this is episode three of three in our very exciting, very weird series on batteries. Make sure you subscribe so you get all the episodes in this series and all the other shows here on Seeker. And check us out as well if you want to get an audio version of this whole series on SoundCloud and iTunes and Anchor and Spotify, you name it, we are there. Okay, so you've already heard about how batteries have a longer history than you know, about how atoms actually move within the battery, which is awesome. But today we're going to talk about how a battery may never die. Well, this specific one anyway. We're going to talk about solid batteries, liquid batteries, electrical storage devices that aren't even considered batteries, and where this march of technology is actually going. It's going to be super great, so let's kick into it. The future of batteries is going to be weird and crazy. Right now, there's the anode, it gives up electrons, the cathode that takes them, and the electrolyte that connects the two together, right? That's often a liquid or a gel. This is every battery. There are also stretchy liquid or gel batteries. Those are things that exist. The thing is, those battery types are all kind of traditional. What about batteries of the future? So think of stretchy batteries, or liquid batteries, gel batteries. These are all things that exist. We've talked about them before here on Seeker, and they are still often based on the same kind of structure. Lithium ion batteries are great. The thing is though, they're inflexible. They can't be bent. They can't be, you know, reformed in any way. They're also inflammable, which by the way, means the same thing as flammable. We had a conversation amongst our team about that. Yeah, they mean the same thing. So a team of researchers created a new kind of glue that can bind the battery elements together in a flexible framework using hydrogels. They can take the anode and the cathode and they can put in a springy shape or into a bendable shape to create a battery that's stretchy. But it's still not great because it's still based on lithium ion technology. So it's a solid lithium inside of a stretchy case the lithium doesn't flex, just the case flexes. So if we want something that's really moldable, we're going to have to go away from that altogether to a whole new kind of chemistry. And that brings in liquid batteries. Using the chemistry of electric eels, some researchers have created a liquid battery. Biomimicry, by the way, is my favorite thing. It's when we copy nature. And it's actually, well, actually, it's my second favorite thing. My first favorite thing is Beyonce mimicry or Bay mimicry. Yeah, it's a thing. Anyway, biomimicry. By alternating patterns of saltwater and freshwater hydrogels, you can create a liquid battery. Because saltwater carries negative charges. It's got ions in it. The negative ions from the saltwater move into the freshwater when they're placed in little packets next to each other. So when they're arranged in a lattice of these little packets, voila, a battery, which is super cool. But it's still not practical yet. Something that might be practical is going the other way. When batteries go hard, we get solid state batteries. In Nature Materials in 2011, there was a solid electrolyte researched. And it can move ions, just like a gel can, but it does it without explosions or sensitivity to cold, which a saltwater freshwater battery would have. It also doesn't use gel, which is great because the gel is part of the problem with lithium ion batteries and their explosive capabilities. So what they did is they used a 3D tetrahedral framework of lithium, germanium, phosphorus, and sulfur. This framework lets the ions move through the lattice, hopping from one molecule to the next. Again, it's not a gel, it's a solid. It's sort of like the atomic version of a jungle gym. The ions are just moving through the lattice, jumping from one molecule to the next. You could actually, according to the researchers, quote, drive a nail through the battery and it wouldn't explode. And plus, it's safe for hundreds of thousands of charge cycles. But we don't actually have it because it was super experimental back in 2011. And even though it's been years, and we tend to think of technology as advancing quicker and quicker and quicker, in reality, it takes a long time to come up with these inventions. They didn't plan the next iPhone starting after the previous one was released. They're years ahead of their release schedule. You know, they're planning the iPhone 12 probably now, right? And that's how science works as well. So even though in the intervening years they've come out with super ionic materials, which are crystalline structures that ions can hop through, they haven't actually perfected them into battery technology. And still, most of these electrolytes, maybe you've noticed, are lithium-based. 
and none are commercially available. As Alex said earlier in the episode, it's a lot of trial and error to figure out what materials and chemistry work the best inside of these very specific conditions. We're trying to make nature do something that on its own it doesn't really seem to do. You don't just you know, plug into a tree and get electricity, right? Nature doesn't naturally want to create this kind of chemistry. It's volatile and it could be damaging. So instead, we have to bend chemistry and bend nature to our will. And that takes some time. And of course, all of these batteries still have that same problem that we've sort of alluded to throughout this whole series, and that is that they'll die unless we can find a way to make them not die like with the vanadium redox flow battery. It's a really cool design. It's essentially like the liquid battery in that there are different groups of electrolytes. However, it's completely different. The Atlantic had a write-up on the vanadium redox flow battery in 2014. It uses a 250 kilowatt battery system inside of a 40 foot container, and it's hooked up to a solar or wind energy project usually. So that way you have this battery that potentially never dies and is recharged by renewable energy. The chemical reactions inside of this battery work like this. There are two electrolyte solutions, the catholite and analyte with vanadium. Vanadium, by the way, in case you aren't familiar with the periodic table, it's number 23. It's a natural transition metal element. The University of New South Wales does a lot of research on these batteries, and how they describe it is this. The catholite and analyte of vanadium flow through electrode chambers with a membrane that separates them. But because that membrane is porous to ions, the ions can hop between the two. The energy then coming into the system would reverse that ion flow. So the catholite and analyte ion flow is creating that electron movement that you need in order to make a circuit, just like we talked about earlier. In doing that, of course, they have to reverse the ion flow, and that's where the solar or wind power comes in. It pushes the ions back through the membrane, back into their original positions. The nice thing about this type of battery is that the solutions themselves have an indefinite shelf life, which means the battery could technically never expire or die. It could be recharged instantly. All you'd have to do is swap out the electrolyte. And vanadium is super cheap. But I don't know if you paid attention to this earlier, but it's a 40 foot long system that produces kilowatts of power. It's not great for devices. It's more for homes and neighborhoods, especially in very rural areas. It's very much not great for computers and devices and little things that we're using every day that batteries have heavy impact on. But you know what? As long as we're being crazy, right? If we're gonna go with these things that look like they come out of Die Hard with a Vengeance, but they're batteries, maybe we should just bring capacitors back. Remember capacitors? It's like storing electricity. It's not using chemistry, because who needs chemistry? Just kidding, I really like chemistry. Sorry, Mr. Bright from high school. I definitely really like chemistry. I would never say that, that's just mean. But batteries, they use chemistry to store energy and capacitors, they just store electricity directly. So why do we wanna have batteries at all? Why not capacitors forever? Remember the Leyden jars from Ben Franklin's experiments? Those were capacitors and they were networked together to produce a pretty big jolt. If you've been around our channel, then you know graphene is the best. Just do the graphene dance. I love graphene, I really do, it's really great. Graphene is, if you're not aware, a one atom thick carbon lattice. Ions can move through the lattice very easily and it holds them like an atomic version of the Leyden jar. The lattice can discharge when needed and did I mention that this is also a biodegradable and abundant resource? Seriously, you can actually make graphene out of wood. In 2012, we learned to make graphene with DVD burners. It's called laser-scribed graphene, and it's literally the DVD burner that you'd go to the store and buy. Then you take it, slice it in half, you add an electrolyte, and boom, you've got yourself a graphene supercapacitor. I mean, you have a really, really tiny one. The problem is, even though studies show that it has high power and high energy density, and those studies are still coming out as if we need convincing, they're not actually commercially viable yet. And that's the problem. See, scaling up graphene means that even though we know it's there, we know how great it is, and we know it's the future, we can't make it. At least not at a scale where it matters. Until now. What they do is they create a slurry with a solvent in alkaline conditions. 
That slurry is then used to directly 3D print conductive graphene aerogels, like a spongy material. It's not actually a gel. They claim that this process is scalable and could create graphene at an industrial level, meaning that we could get graphene supercapacitors out here in the world. And what if we got to a point where battery technology could do this? I mean, that's amazing, but we're not there yet. So instead, we just have to imagine this future where battery technology is so good that we don't have to worry about it anymore. As of now, I think you probably know, based on everything we've been talking about over the last few episodes or 45 minutes, depending on where you're listening to this, batteries are a hodgepodge of all sorts of different technologies and different disciplines working together to try and make the best thing that they can that can push electrons through whatever device you need. But another problem is all of these people are coming at it from different angles and every single device, every single little piece of technology has different requirements. It's really tough. It's a tough field to be in. But imagine this, a capacitor that stores lots of energy for hundreds of thousands of charge cycles, never corrodes, so lasts a long or short amount of time. They never die or expire. We could make them small and powerful. We created all of these technologies individually already. We just have to put them together, right? But there's one more thing that I just wanted to bring into this discussion that we haven't talked about yet, and that is wireless charging. Because if you take batteries and you combine them with good wireless charging, then maybe batteries will be good enough that we just don't need to think about them at all anymore. They don't need to be perfect. They just need to store enough energy for now, right? Imagine if everywhere you were, batteries were just charging all the time. Wireless charging could get to a point where we just don't really care about batteries anymore. Then technology could become a kind of magic. Wireless charging uses an electromagnetic flux to push electrons around wires from a distance. It uses the power from our walls, which is an alternating current, and that changes direction 60 times a second, or at about 60 hertz. In a wireless charging situation, it moves at more like five or 10 hertz, but that's enough to charge a battery. So imagine that we could create a space where that happened all the time, whether it was your office building or your home or your car or all three. We would just need the battery to last in between those places. And if you went to another building and there was a standard, your battery would just be charged all the time. Last year, researchers created a room that was entirely filled with these alternating fields, potentially powering everything in the space. It's not ready yet, but imagine, just imagine, everything charged all the time, no matter where you were. In movies, there's alien technologies, right, that stop working when they take it away from the alien ship or planet. It's a nice plot device, but to be honest, it's also a nice idea because maybe the reason the alien technology stops working is because it's not near the wireless charging ports that they had, right? It's a simple concept, and to me, this is really what makes the whole battery discussion worth having. Because if we can make wireless charging work, then the batteries are already good enough. Maybe they don't actually suck. We just don't have to plug them in anymore. In Star Trek, they don't charge their phasers or their pads. Maybe they use wireless technology. I know they don't actually, they use cerium corellite batteries, but that's fine, whatever, I read the books too. Without batteries, what would you have? Just a tiny piece of expensive design with rare metals in it. Do you think the ancient Persians with their Baghdad battery or Ben Franklin with the Leyden jars knew what it is that they had? Nikola Tesla, one of the fathers of our electrical future and internet meme, once said, the spread of civilization may be likened to a fire First, a feeble spark, next, a flickering flame, then a mighty blaze, ever increasing in speed and power. Human activity has become so widespread and intense that years count as centuries of progress. There is no more groping in the dark or accidentally stumbling upon discoveries. Results follow one another like links in a chain. Such is the force of the accumulated knowledge and the insight into natural laws and phenomena that future events are clearly projected before our vision. To foretell what is coming would be no more than to draw logical conclusions were it not for the difficulty in accurately fixing the time of accomplishment. So if we want to predict where the battery will be, we just have to keep on this chain of events. So where do you think it's gonna go? Thanks so much everyone for watching Seeker Plus. For more episodes, please subscribe to the audio podcast. We get new episodes every week. Just subscribe wherever you get your casts. Thank you so much to those who have rated and liked and shared these episodes. 
Suggest topics on Twitter. You can find us at Seeker or me at Trace Dominguez. And thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.